Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and I have a special episode for you today, much like we did for Mountain Bike National Championships. This week, we are interviewing a handful of athletes from the men's and women's side of the Leadville 100 mountain bike race that's going on in Leadville, Colorado this weekend. It's a very popular race for a lot of you who uh, listen to this podcast and use Trainer Road and those that don't use Trainer Road but listen to the podcast and plenty others. It's a very popular race. Uh, but what we can learn, even if we aren't ever going to do Leadville, we can learn from these athletes about what they are doing to prepare leading into such a big day and execute on such a big day at high elevation of 10,000 feet average elevation, big climbs and group tactics. It's very interesting. So uh, we hope you enjoy this episode with these pro athletes. We ask them the same questions and then we play their answers back for you. So it's uh, cool to be able to compare and contrast. Uh, one quick note before we go in is that these athletes are traveling while we're interviewing them and showing up in foreign cir foreign circumstances where they don't know about their internet connection, sound, all that stuff. So some of the sound is pretty rough. Uh, we did our best to be able to salvage it. If you can't hear something and you have further questions on it, just go to the Trainer Road forum and we can try to fill in the gaps for you. Uh, you can find an episode or a forum post specifically for this episode, which is episode 320. So without further ado, we hope you enjoyed this special episode and good luck to all of you who are racing Leadville. It's an exciting day and something you should absolutely be proud of. My name is Alex Wild. I race for Orange Seal and Specialized for mountain bikes mostly. Hey, my name is uh, Eddie Anderson. I'm a rider for the Alpha and Fenix uh, pro cycling team. And yeah, I'm super excited this year to be sort of introducing the team into the gravel side of the sport. And um, next up, Leadville 100. My name is Katarina Nash. I race for the Cliff Pro Team. I have been racing for the Cliff Pro Team for 20 years, uh, which is pretty incredible. Anyway, I've been fortunate to kind of try a little bit of everything as far as cycling disciplines. Uh, uh, started as a mountain biker, added cyclocross, dabbed in some gravel and road racing. So a little bit of everything, a little bit of, I mean, lots of the short distance and now doing little bit more of the endurance stuff, getting a really, really good scope of what cycling is all about. <laughs> Keegan Swenson with uh, Santa Cruz Bicycles. Hi, I am Laura King. I live in Richmond, Vermont. I am a race director and a marketing and sales consultant for various uh, brands in the cycling world. And I'm supported by brands like Cannondale, SRAM, Zip, 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 Velocio, Untapped, Moose Packs, and Roca. Howdy, I'm Pete Stetna. I am a gravel privateer that is a roadie background and trying to, to keep up on the mountain bike sometimes, doing, doing the long stuff, the FKTs and, and the Leadville. My name is Rose Grant. I am on the Juliana SRAM Pro Team, uh, the first inaugural year for the team. And this is my second time racing Leadville. Um, and I guess I won race it for the first time in 2019 and also won the race so i'm here to, to defend my title this year Hi, my name is hannah finchamp and i ride for the orange seal off-road team my name is alex house i ride for yeah pro cycling yeah education person EFO pro cycling i will be participating slash racing in the mountain bike race this year my name is sarah sturm and i'm a bike racer for here we go. Specialized Rafa, Wahoo, SRAM, Hydroflask. Have you done anything unique to prepare for Leadville? Nothing unique. Uh, uh, we've had it on the schedule all year. So I think we've had it kind of in the back of the mind um, as we came off of XC Nats, we were less focused on like punchy stuff. And it was more like we did some 15 minute stuff and a few longer rides like over the weekend I did a four-hour ride which if you follow me on Strava you know is a rare occurrence for me to to break the four-hour barrier so just a little check-in I mean we know I can ride that far but just kind of like check how it feels and I did also Tahoe Trail 100 and the Leadville Stage Race so I've done more endurance events since XC Nats to kind of prepare for this and just test out fueling but also just I think in a race like that you kind of go through every mental like feeling there is right like you go from feeling great to feeling like crap and then you come back from it and then it's like whoa I can actually finish and it's just kind of 
I guess making that emotional roller coaster not foreign. So you know, like I can feel this trash and come back from it or, you know, kind of face those demons before the day. For this year for Leadville 100, uh, it's a race I've always wanted to do. And I think my preparation has been uh, pretty good over the past couple weeks. Um, nothing super unique, but um, just a lot of long, big rides and um, trying to stay at uh, elevation yeah, before the race. So this time around for Leadville, I raced Leadville once, but it was, I was still racing the World Cup. So I think I came from Montsenand directly to here. And this time around, I had the luxury of uh, doing a, a road trip. So I started with Belgian Waffle Ride, uh, then drove to Colorado, did Telluride 100, which was two weeks after Belgian Waffle Ride. And now two weeks after Telluride 100 is Leadville 100. So I feel like it's been definitely a unique prep because, you know, I don't do Century every other weekend, <laughs> but all those races have been a great preparation. I don't, I don't love the long days on the bike. So to go out on seven hour training ride, that sounds really hard, but like doing a race, I think that's been a great prep. And so the other thing that I'm doing a little bit differently now is like, yeah, I got myself to Colorado early enough based out of 9,000 feet and riding up to 12,000 feet. And uh, I'm from the same area as you guys are, Lake Tahoe area, which is around 6,000 feet. And it's just, for me, that's just, that's just not enough. I need a little bit more time to adapt to this altitude and to, to perform better. Like I think I can train my body to, to function and to compete really well at that 12,000 feet mark. But I definitely felt like spending a little extra time here will benefit me. And I, I feel, I really feel like I'm getting to that point that it's just like that thousand, 10,000, 11,000 doesn't feel as hard as it did a couple of weeks ago when I got here. So, yeah, so that's been, that's, that's been kind of the different thing for me. Um, in general, I mean, I, I like to prepare for any upcoming event to my best ability. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, being at altitude and doing a bunch of long, long rides and long events, has been, it's been helpful. And I haven't had that, like, World Cup season to worry about or, you know, cross-country racing to worry about. So that really allowed me to, to prepare. Yes and no, I guess. That's kind of a hard question. <laughs> I did do the Telluride 100 uh, last weekend, which I guess was in preparation for Leadville. I think uh, getting a 100-mile race in at, you know, a similar altitude and kind of similar. I mean, there's more, more single track at Telluride, but still has a lot of fire road as well. Um, so kind of similar, similar conditions, whatnot. I have actually. Um, and that is, I am trying to balance finding or having a great race with kind of also the peak of my, you know, my work. We just, um, last weekend was rooted Vermont and I'm oh, sorry, one and a half weeks ago, which is really kind of the peak of like my work for the year. Um, I mean, it's an ongoing project all year long, but where the volume of work is really concentrated is in the last six weeks prior to the event. And it's full on and just, it's a lot of like physical labor and a lot of emotional and mental um, labor as well. So I was a little bit um, nervous about trying to <laughs> put an event like Leadville two weeks after something that's so taxing. Um, but at the same time, uh, I'm, I've been, you know, I haven't been able to do a lot of racing because I've rooted and I'm anxious to get back into events. And, um, Leadville has always been a race that has excite that gets me excited. Um, I've done it twice and I've still kind of, it was eight years ago that I last raced it. So I'm, I'm a different person now. I'm curious what I can do. And, you know, I actually asked my husband, Ted, if he would put a little bit of a training schedule together for me. He's a coach and I uh, really just kind of, you know, the last six weeks or so and asked him to kind of like show me what he thought it would look like. And if we thought we could kind of work it 
balance, find a balance between the work that was happening with our event and trying to get the training in. And, um, I think I found too, that sometimes when you're the most busy, it can help you be really kind of just focused. And, um, sometimes when I have a really full plate, it's where I execute the best. So I decided to give it, you know, give it my best shot and see what happens. Yeah. You know, Leadville is one of the biggest, I call it a gravel race, actually. First of all, I'm going to say Leadville is a gravel race because I would say it's the original gravel race because even though the best tool I think I could argue is a mountain bike, um, it's run in the gravel format. And we've kind of all discussed how gravel is not really a terrain. It's a style. It's the mass participation, everybody starting together, ultra endurance, bucket list route. Um, and honestly, like you could do Leadville on a modern gravel bike. There's just like 10 to 15 miles where life would really suck. Um, I've totally considered it. Um, and I think there is a setup where it would be fast. I kind of was hoping that people doing the lead boat, meaning Leadville and then steamboat the next morning would have to use the exact same bike because then it would make it a lot more interesting. Um, but that said, uh, this is a big objective. It's one of the biggest races in the U.S. I think it's the biggest mountain bike race in the U.S. Um, and uh, the main thing I'm trying to do is just get as high elevation training as possible. <clears throat> so I've been boondocking my van in copper. Um, I'll be in Netherlands these next three days in Colorado. I was in Tahoe a week before, and then I'll be in Leadville for three nights before too. So yeah, just 10,000 feet. Like it sucks for everybody, but I think there is a way to kind of minimize it a little bit. I know it takes bets, so that helps a lot. I did start sleeping in an altitude tent this spring, more of an experiment and not knowing if my life would allow me to spend the time at altitude necessary to acclimate. And after my performance in 2019, I did realize that Spending the time and investing in the time to acclimate was a really key component for me. Um, after all the other preparation that's put into it, I might as well just finish it off and do it correctly. Um, so I got an altitude tent and that made a significant difference at nationals in Winter Park. And um, so far I've felt pretty good here at my time um, at altitude in Colorado preparing for Leadville as well. I think the most unique thing I've done to prepare for Leadville is really optimizing my race setup, because I think for this race, a light setup is going to be really crucial, but it's also a super long race. So comfort is really critical as well. So finding the balance between light and comfort has been something that I've been playing with for several weeks now. Well, I've been preparing for this for a long time. Uh at least uh, the last what, 33 years, I was born and raised at altitude, uh, which is, you know, we're talking ideal preparation. Um, and then I, in the last, what, three, four years, I moved uh, up to Netherlands, Colorado, uh, which is, our house is at 8,500 feet, uh, 2,500 meters for the metric folks out there. Uh, but really, in general, uh, talking more specifically about actual race preparation, uh, definitely pushed out some longer rides uh, and have gone for, uh, kind of going for more of that high tempo, long endurance sort of stuff versus the real punchy uh, sort of stuff that we do for road racing. Yes, uh, I always do kind of unique things to prep for races. Um, actually, this one is a lot more upstairs in the brain um, part of my body. And um, as my coach says, uh, the hay is in the barn, so I'm as fit as I could be, um, just honestly from racing, but um, I am focusing kind of on my mental approach to this. I actually just did this thing called a sensory deprivation tank. Um, it was wild. I, the one downside, I still have water in my ears. <laughs> So I never thought I would have to deal with swimmers here as a professional cyclist, but here I am. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm actually doing that. I have met um, with like my whole team from like therapists, coaches, um, strength coach. Well, she's not really strength. She's more like holistic body. Um, and then my massage therapist. And we're all just kind of trying to work on the like neurological side 
Um, so, and that just means like how your brain talks to your body. So I'm trying to work on that piece as well as like going in with like a really mentally healthy headspace to this race. Cause I was not a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I was really nervous. <laughs> what has your training been like leading into Leadville? Been doing four by 15 minute stuff. I've been at altitude up at Tahoe. So I've been at altitude the longest ever in my career. So since June 24th, I think, when I flew up to Copper for XC Nats, I've been at altitude since then. So for me, that was kind of the biggest, I guess, change is obviously, you know, the 10 to 14 days gets you what most people call acclimatization, but it's kind of basic acclimatization. It gets you most of the way there, but there's still physiological changes that are happening all the way out to six weeks, but even like multiple years at altitude that your body adapts to. So I was curious to see if I would notice a big difference after six weeks. Um, and I feel like it was the right call so far. Um, it's definitely been interesting. Uh, three weeks ago, I did the uh, third episode of the impossible route with Jeremiah Bishop and Tyler Pierce, the vegan cyclist. And um, so that was like, that was a 50 hour week <laughs> or like 50 hour, five days. So I got a lot of volume in there. And then I basically took a week completely off. Um, after that, now I'm, I just finished a solid training block solely on the mountain bike, um, in Crested Butte, Colorado place. I've always wanted to go. And like, it's, it's hard to beat the riding here. You just want to ride all day. Um, and there's, there's not much, uh, I don't think there's much better preparation I could be doing than just spending long hours on the mountain bike right now. And but now it's time to rest. So this week is super mellow um, and do some openers on Friday before race day. So specifically with Leadville, like I mentioned, like I did the two big events leading up to that. So it's like, you know, month before Leadville, I did seven hours, roughly 15 minutes at Belgium Waffle Ride. Big, big, you know, big day. Then I made my way into Colorado and tried to get used to the altitude and then, you know, hit it with Telluride 100, which turned out to be eight hours, 20 minutes. We took a little, we, we got lost for 20 minutes probably. <laughs> so added a little extra race time. And then since then, you know, I haven't done tons of long rides, but I try to increase my intensity a little bit just to like test the body at that elevation and see how, how, how that race effort really feels like. And uh, this week, uh, really, really leading up to Leadville, I think uh, I'm just going to rest quite a bit. I definitely feel a little tired from, <laughs> from the training, from the racing, from a little bit of travel. And I, I, I just want to be fresh going into this last, last big event, um, this last 100-mile event. So a little bit of resting and a little bit more pre-riding on the course. I definitely would like to see a couple more sections. Trying to add a little bit of volume when I can, but still trying to recover. It's been this like balancing act. I feel like the last couple of weeks after nationals, like peak for nationals, hit BWR and then rested, trained a little bit, did tele ride. And then we've just been kind of resting and training and yeah, it's been, it's been interesting, but I think it'll work well. Well, it's really interesting because I just out of, I had a, I had eight years ago, what I thought was a great race at Leadville for me at the time, I was still kind of in my multi-sport, um, competitiveness, um, racing triathlon, but I see, I was, I think I was seventh place in 2013 and had dropped 50 minutes from my Leadville time the pr uh, year prior, which to me, was, you know, a lot more than I ever thought I was able, was able to do. And so I took a look back at my training kind of in my mind thinking, well, I was in really good shape then, you know, let's see if I'm doing anything, if my training looks anything like it did back then. And I was surprised actually to see how low my cycling volume was. And, um, especially compared to how, how it has been over the past six months, um, this year. And so that actually gave me a boost of confidence. And I thought, you know, maybe, I mean, there's something to be said now just for, you know, at least um, double the amount of volume from last year. I mean, sorry, from 2013. And I wonder what that might do or look like, um, especially now as I'm just 
cycling. I'm mostly just cycling for my training. I'm not swimming or running. So I'm mostly curious to see. It's a little bit of an experiment, like eight years later and um, different training, what, what that might do. Um, but I also am cognizant of the fact that with altitude, it's just sort of a, sometimes you show up and you feel great. And sometimes you feel terrible. You never know exactly what that day might bring with um, the fact that I'm not going there. I always get there at the last minute. That's, I just don't have the time to, um, you know, go to altitude for two plus weeks or something. So I'm just going to, I mean, my approach is really do as best as I can with what the, you know, with what my life constraints will allow. And um, at the end of the day, I have a lot of things going on. I have a daughter who's one and a half and business, you know, we, my husband and I are, have businesses and work. And so I, it's important to me. I'd like to do well, but it's also not the only thing I have going on in life. And so it's like, I just have to do the best that I can with what I, with what I'm given. <laughs> not as good as I would have liked, honestly. Um, it's been a long season with a very busy summer due to all the spring COVID cancellations. Um, and while I am very much honed in on Leadville, um, I have pretty much been nursing a peak fitness from Unbound through Oregon Trail, Crusher and the Tusher, uh, Belgian Waffle Ride, the Rift in Iceland. So um, I can feel like I'm kind of starting to crest that wave and it's kind of just like plugging holes in a sinking ship right now and just trying to hold on for another week. Um, that said, it's, you know, it's one day, two days for lead boat. Um, and you can always kind of like rest just enough to kind of like show up for a day. It's not like we're doing a week long stage race. Um, but, uh, I'm kind of just going to rely on all that race fitness. I mean, two weeks ago was the rift in Iceland and it was a seven hour brutal course race. So, um, that's kind of been the big thing. And then just for me and my lack of technical skill against the mountain bike purists, um, I am riding my mountain bike more than I ever have. Well, ever since nationals, which was like second weekend in July, um, I did do a hundred miler close to home in Butte, Montana called the Butte 100. Uh, it's a nine and a half hour hundred miler, like pretty slow um, and really tough, but more or less it was training just to practice dialing in my nutrition and pacing. And so that was on the 24th of July. So in the last few weeks since then, it really was more or less about recovery while still kind of keeping the body open, but mostly just endurance riding. And then I've been here since the first weekend in August. So I'm going into my second week um, at altitude here. I'm staying at Copper Mountain. And same thing, I did one structured ride, but aside from that, it's really just been about just learn, kind of relearning boundaries um, and perceived effort as to what it feels like to ride at altitude. So in order to accomplish that, rather than like having structure based on numbers, it's really just been endurance riding and course check and just making sure that the body is rested and recovered and feeling good. Then, you know, I think as professional athletes, we're always pushing the limit. And so it hasn't been super different. Um, I think the biggest change for me is actually the way I'm viewing everything mentally, you know, so I'm really focused on the intervals towards the end of the ride. I'm really thinking about everything fatigue resistance wise. Um, and I'm just really picturing those long, long climbs in Leadville. You know, I live in Salt Lake City. And so a lot of elevation per ride is not an uncommon thing, but definitely viewing that differently, thinking about, okay, this is X amount of feet. The race is going to be this many more feet and things like that. And then of course, getting in a good taper, resting up, but also knowing that I'm coming to elevation, uh, even higher, high, high elevation. Um, and so being cognizant of that and playing with pre-riding the course and also making sure I'm getting plenty extra recovery since it's a little bit harder to recover up here. In the last few weeks it's been, you know, longer rides, uh, some pretty big hours, honestly. Um, and trying to, you know, get up high and, uh, sort of feel what that effort feels like um, at altitude uh, around here. You know, we're crawling this which is 11,600 feet, 500 feet, something like that. Um, so not quite Columbine height, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's 
definitely sucks because I'm going hard up there. Um, and then, yeah, this this last week has been a fair bit lighter. I'm just sort of doing to taper things off and don't want to go into it super tired. <laughs> oh, you mean you have to train on the bike? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I did uh, a massive race at sea level, which is, and it was super flat, <laughs> which at first I was like kind of debating if that was going to play into the training, but we decided that that was actually perfect to kind of help with like some of my weaknesses. Um, so I did, a, we'll just call it a week long training camp at sea level, AKA traveling around Iceland. And then I came back to where I live in Durango, which is, um, luckily a really awesome elevation. So I sleep at about 7,000 feet and then I can get up to, you know, I've been doing a couple big training blocks up above. Um, I should not say big training blocks, a couple of big rides <laughs> above uh, 11,000 feet. Um, and it's just kind of right in my backyard. So um, honestly, not a ton of structure. I'm just like going out and riding with my friends and my dog in the high country and did a couple hard efforts up high and we're calling it good. <laughs> what is your nutrition plan for race day? I will be shooting for around hundred grams of carbs an hour. Um, most of that'll be from Morton 320, Morton, however you say it, 320 satchels in my bottles. Um, I'll supplement that with scratch or water depending on if it's hot on the day and I feel like I need the extra sodium and then I'll do SIS gels as well so to begin when it's cold I probably won't need the extra fluid so I'll do a Morton 320 and an SIS gel an hour and then as we get to like the middle to the end of the race I'll probably start grabbing um, an extra water bottle or a scratch bottle from the feed zones and try to kind of depending on how hot it is, probably nurse that second bottle over like a couple hours, like getting my main fuel source from the morning, but also having the other one on board just so if I need more fluid, because the, the Morton stuff is pretty strict on 500 milliliters for like that hydrogel consistency for the gut. And I've had really good experience with the Morton 320 not messing me up. I did when I did Leadville three years ago, I did the same, same program and I was, I was happy the whole race gut wise with alveson fenix sponsored by four gold nutrition i think we have like some of the best product out there um so i'll do um like a carb mix in the in every bottle that i take um particularly at altitude where you're burning through glycogen a lot faster um i think that's going to be especially important and then we have some four gold also makes a really good uh gels and bars the gels are like super easy to get down you don't have to drink it take it with water or anything so yeah primarily just for gold nutrition and um i think it's the best out there tend to do like smaller breakfast than i would probably cross before cross country event because before the cross country you kind of have typically lot more time, you know, you might be racing at 10, 11, sometimes midday cyclocross, you're racing afternoon, you know, <laughs> but with the long distance, it's always early morning, 630. So I probably go for a little, a uh, little bit uh, lighter breakfast, because uh, the start will be pretty quick. Uh, and then start hitting uh, cliff, uh, cliff bar blocks and cliff bar shots. Uh, right away, just keep up with it as much as possible. Uh, I, I worry about like drinking too much before the race because then sometimes you have to pee, especially when it's cold and early morning. So I typically start drinking more once I'm on the bike racing. I don't drink much before, before the race. Uh, manage, manage the, <laughs> the bladder. <laughs> And uh, I, I probably, I kind of played around having a little bit of solid food in the last two races, just because it feels good on the stomach. Um, so at the Belgian waffle ride where there's long sections on the road and you can actually kind of sit in the group a little bit, I, I, I managed to eat half of a cliff bar, which I think really helped me out because it wasn't just like gel or a block and, um, and then obviously with the 
higher altitude and the like the breathing is heavier you know when you're 10,000 feet it's really hard to chew uh, but the cliff bar also makes these like uh, peanut butter filled in bars that are much softer to kind of chew than your traditional cliff bar so I'll probably carry one of those as well to try to kind of have some of the solid food half a mark you know or whenever the opportunity comes up on the road I'm not very strategic with the food like you have to eat every half an hour because sometimes you're descending for 10 minutes you know so I don't want to have that like complete strategy but I just try to keep up with both eating and drinking from the from the gun so the same as same as usual for me for these long events I'll try and take in roughly 100 grams of carbs an hour and mostly drink mix um, and then some goo gels and probably some rice crispy treats and some other, like, you could call them solid food, but not really, you know. <laughs> um, nutrition is a challenging one for me. Um, I tend to, in longer efforts over, like, usually over around seven to eight hours, I, I both times I've raised Leadville, I, I get pretty sick. Um, actually, once I finish the race, I get pretty sick. And so I'm a little nervous about that. Um, and I'm just, it's, it's, I think, because my stomach you know, you're going so hard and then you have the added altitude to deal with that your gut is just shunting so much blood away from it. And I seem to have a real, like, a, a bigger issue with that than others. So I'm um, trying to incorporate some real food. I'm going to make some, uh, Alan Lim has a recipe for these like rice and egg bites. Um, and I tried them in training recently and they just tasted so good. It was nice to have some real food that was savory and that was really palatable and easy to digest. Um, but other than that, um, if you know anything about Ted King and our household, we are a big maple proponent. So I'll be doing some untapped maple syrup. Um, and normally I would be using maple aid, um, but I actually will go back to using a um, goo product, Roctane, because I, in mountain bike races, I'm going to use the Summit Tea um, Roctane drink because in mountain bike races, I enjoy, or I find it helpful to be able to drink more of my calories and not be struggling to, you know, get food out of my pockets as much. So that'll be one shift from what I normally do. Start eating early and keep eating. Uh, first of all, for Leadville, but um, also for this, this lead boat challenge, I mean, it's you got to be eating for the day after it's not just a one day for, for a few of us. Um, so, I mean, I'm taking a high carb drink to start in the cold morning hours and that'll be kind of switching more to like basic mix and water stuff. Um, bunch of bars. Um, you know, the fact that there are kind of feed zones in Leadville, I'll try to, you know, run light and utilize the musette bag things, which is kind of the, the game of Leadville. It's totally cool there. Um, and, uh, yeah, the biggest thing I think is actually going to be the tactics. It's just, you know, for, for us lace, racing the lead boat, it's, um, they're, they're instead of every, it's not a combined race, like a normal stage race. So there's guys that are solely focused on Leadville and solely focused on Steamboat. Um, so I could see a situation where, because there's so much prize money, for example, in Steamboat, if, uh, if Leadville is not going the way of some people, shut it down and try to save it for the next day you know still finish you you finish the damn race that's what you're there for um you don't quit that's the Leadville motto right um but you know i'm curious on how that will play if guys are going to start thinking about the next day and what they're actually maybe better suited towards that said i am thinking about Leadville first and steamboat secondarily and just try to get through that and then try to raise uh raise some of those favorites Obviously, you want to really be conscious about hydration, um, and not just in general at altitude, but especially going into the event, just making sure that you're really hydrated. And in conjunction with that, it's important to be taking electrolytes, too, so that your body is absorbing the hydration, too, and not just it passing through your body. Um, so goo and salt stick both offer, like, really great options for me for that. And then... For the race, it is drink and eat often and early in the race. So personally, I'll have a combination of water 
in my water bottles and then also Goo Roxane hydration drink mix in my water bottles. And I'll do a combination of uh, the Roxane gels, the Goo Roxane gels. And for a long event, for a solid food, I really like the rice bars. Um, they're made with sushi rice and I make them savory. So they're still like a fast absor absorbing carbohydrate option, but not sweet. So it's just a really nice um, change from like all the, the goo and the hydration drink mix. And so you're getting something salty um, and savory. So I'll eat at least three of those during the race. And then I have like it pretty mapped out as far as, you know, what to be eating and drinking where on the course, um, just because, you know, that is a game changer in your performance and a critical piece to make sure you have dial and have a great plan going into that. Yeah, I that is always plan and execution are two different things, right? <laughs> so I think um, for me, I think 50 to 80 grams of carbs per hour would be something that I'm confident I can actually execute. You know, that's a realistic goal for me. Um, and then I think the way that I do that is going to be critical, you know, because I think a lot of the time you can look at your bike computer and say, oh my gosh, it's been 45 minutes and I haven't eaten anything. This is my hour window. And then you just shove in all of those carbs into your mouth. And at least for me, that's never been the optimal strategy. So I really want to break it out across that hour really well. And um, yeah, I mean, I think when I am eating well, when I'm eating that 50 to 80 grams of carbs an hour well, to me as a racer, it feels like I'm almost eating constantly. Probably almost like a high carbohydrate mix in my bottles. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think I've got the big ones up to like 140 grams of carbohydrate. Uh, so, Killer. yeah, and yeah, sucking those down. I think if I get maybe three of those in me, it uh, should get me pretty far. Uh, and then, you know, six and a half hour race. Uh, yeah, we want some normal food out there too. So, we'll probably mix up some scratch, some uh, what do you call rice cakes. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, gels in between whenever we do it. So there's some, some, something hard, like let it especially at high altitude, um, be really not efficient when it comes to burning fat. Um, so you really have to stay on top of eating and uh, getting the carbs in. Uh, so, you know, I'll be shooting for like 90, 95 grams of carbohydrate per hour, which is a lot, um, especially for not the biggest guy in the world. So, but I mean, I guess that kind of goes back to the training aspect as well. Um, I've definitely been training the old gut to absorb all those carbs. Actually, it's kind of changed a little bit. I have um, done a lot of hard enough races that I'm actually having a harder time like getting into like the peanut butter and jelly snacks, honestly, because they're so dynamic that I can't really take both hands off the bars easily. And like, I have started um, experimenting with like a caloric um, bottle mix from scratch, like the super hydration, hyper, hy nope, mm, super calorie, whatever. I can't remember the name. Sorry, scratch. So I have been doing that and it's working really well. I really like, cause it's like not a super intense flavor. And then I do um, like gels as much as possible. Um, and then I will do my peanut, I guess signature at this point, my peanut butter jelly sandwiches on like the whitest, grossest bread you can find. Just like super simple carbs that it just works really well. Um, for me, I am still trying to figure out a good way to get a lot of salt in. Cause I just get sugar fatigue. Um, I just don't want to eat at the end of an eight hour race. Um, and especially not sugary things. So. Anyone out there has a hot tip on how to get easily accessible pickles? <laughs> Did you make any unique equipment choices for this race? Nothing I'd call weird. Um, I'll be running my Epic full suspension. I'll still keep the bike yoke dropper on there. Not necessarily because it's technical, but I think there's an advantage like coming down Columbine, like I can sit on the saddle and be arrow and tucked 
so I'm not fatiguing myself in a race that long. Um, mm -hmm. I personally will never race a hardtail in a race that's going to be six, seven hours. No, like maybe if it was like a gravel race or something like that, but on, on true, like, like mountain terrain, dirt roads, and it's bumpy. I think I'm going to be more comfortable and happy on the full suspension. So I'm sticking with that. Um, one change that, uh, ice friction is bringing to the table is they're actually coating my cassette and my chain ring with wax for a few extra games. So I'll have a full ice friction drivetrain on the day. So that comes today, which I'm pretty excited about. And I'll obviously post that on Instagram for everybody to see what that looks like. But I was joking with them that we're, we're making a new SRAM colorway for them because it'll be like that, like blue gray tint that the wax is. So doing that, but that's like the only difference. I'll still run two, three, five Renegades, which I ran at XC. I was considering running narrower tires, but I talked to our tire team and the rolling resistance difference is one negligible between the two, but also like on the bumpier rough terrain, running those two, three, fives at a more comfortable pressure will actually make me faster overall and overall more comfortable. I think the, the can like, when you look at things, right, like I think it comes down to associating violence with speed. Everybody feels like a hard tail with super pinner tires and a rigid post is fast. But I think after testing and having some like metrics to really look at what makes a bicycle fast, like having more comfort in the tires, but also the ability to conform to the terrain will actually make the energy go forward instead of like bouncing up which is where you feel that violence so i feel like i feel like there's some parts on the course where the hardtail will be faster but if you look at the course as a whole i think the fastest bike especially for me is a full suspension with a 235 tires and a dropper and it's just always also what i'm used to i'm not going to try to do something completely foreign for the day still trying to figure that out i guess uh, i did take off my dropper post that's for sure I still don't know if I'm riding the hard tire or the full suspension. Still like pondering my options there. Um, I'm running 2.25 Aspens, which I normally run two fours. So I guess that's a fair bit different. Um, running a 36 to 36 tooth chain ring as normal. Um, yeah. So I guess the equipment hasn't drastically changed to just like small bits and pieces, but um, yeah, that's about it. Um, in terms of like unique, like nothing really in particular, like I'm not going to be running aero bars or anything. Um, I have made sure, like I've, I've found some comfortable positions on the bike, uh, to get aero. Um, and, uh, so maybe wrap a bit of, uh, bar tape around the, the middle of the bars, just so it's a bit more comfortable right there. Um, besides that, not too much. We're, really i think we're really lucky to be sponsored by companies like canyon and shimano just have the best um like equipment out there and i'll be on the canyon lux i think uh i could have chosen the exceed which is the hardtail but i think over a race that's that long um the hardtail even though it's not like a technical mountain bike race will beat you up uh more than you might think and the lux is not that much heavier it's like my bike weighs about 20 pounds so it's, it's pretty light for a full suspension. Yeah, no dropper post. Um, and I'll just wear a normal jersey and bibs because for a race that long, I, I preferred being comfortable over uh, over maybe a marginal gain that like, like that comfort is maybe a, a little bit more energy in the long run. So it probably evens itself out. Well, so for me, uh, the biggest change would be actually getting a hardtail, specialized hardtail. Um, I haven't, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of full suspension technology and a lot of the racing I've done in the past kind of required that sort of bike. So that's kind of what I've been riding last few years, but going into Leadville this year, I really wanted to have the lightest bike. Uh, I wanted to have that like, you know, I don't consider myself this mountain goat climber. So I needed the bike that, <laughs> that can help me to be the best mountain goat climber. And uh, so, yeah, getting back on the hardtail, which obviously I spent many, many years racing hardtail and Leadville is not 
technical. So it's not like um, I'm worried about, you know, the technicality and managing the hardtail, but I am running hardtail with C dropper because uh, once you, once you go uh, that route, it's really hard to go back. And I think the descending even at Leadville is still, you know, it's high speed, there's some cornering and uh, the sea dropper, dropper will help. And, you know, the bike itself is super light. So adding the, the dropper post is not a big disadvantage. Um, and uh, I'm still kind of playing around with a couple ideas um, as far as tires uh, selection. Uh, I'm probably going to run the Maxxis Aspen 2.25, uh, but like I said, I need a couple more rides on the course to really finalize that selection. So No, and you know, thinking about this, I'm wondering like, is there something I maybe should have done? I think it goes back to, I've had so little time to, I can't overthink anything because I just don't even have time. I kind of run what I brung. <laughs> uh, my mountain bike seems to be in decent condition. Uh, it's worked for me on my long training rides and I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> I'd say my biggest equipment choice is using Instagram to troll Keegan and start making him second guess what he's doing. <laughs> Are you sure you want that? That tire, that, that looks kind of thick, man. Like that's, I don't know. You, <laughs> Um, I'm going to be on a dually. I'm going to be on the Canyon Lux, uh, with a 36 front ring. Um, I think you need the 36 late in the day to still climb power line. Uh, 38 might be a little hefty, um, as between the two and, um, some prototype IRC 2.25 tires. Um, the, the same tires I used in the white rim and the Coca Pelli. uh, they should be released soon. And, uh, a stiffy, a high post, stiff post. Um, no dropper. I mean, you're climbing 10,000 feet. I mean, climbing is paramount. That said, I need the dually to try to keep up with the real mountain bike senders on the downhills because that's actually where I lost the pace of, of the winner um, was off the descent of Columbine. And our gap actually kind of stayed the same in 2019, even over the power line. Although, you know, so um, yeah, I, I, need to, I know I need to go downhill faster this year. So I'm going with the dually, but I'm going with the high post and just going to like slam my, my belly button on that thing. You know, I was pretty torn about bike choice up until yesterday. I just kind of had to have a conversation with my coach just to confirm <laughs> what bike to race. Um, the Juliana Wilder is my full suspension and it's light and I really enjoyed riding it. So I was hoping to ride that, but I did choose to ride my Santa Cruz highball, which is my hard tail. Um, I do think this is a race that's going to be one on the climbs primarily, and that bike is the lighter option. So that's what I'm going for. Um, and I'm also planning to ride a 2.4 Aspen on the front with a 2.25 Aspen Maxxis Aspen in the rear. Um, and then my reserve 28 wheels, which are a little wider. They add nice volume. Um, and then I would say for clothing equipment thing that I like to do is at Twin Lakes before I start my climb up to Columbine I will include a wind jacket um, in that stop to put in my pocket just because you know it's a safe option that's super high up there and you just never know what could roll in in the mountains for weather and you know if something wants to happen like that could make or break your day too. <laughs> Um, I'll be racing my hard tail for this race. So my Trek Pro Caliber, which nowadays can be considered a unique uh, equipment choice since full suspensions are so light now and everyone seems to go with that. But I think for this race, every little bit will really make a big difference. Um, so that light and fast setup is going to be really big for me. And then I'm still debating on tires. Um, I've been leaning towards a faster, lighter tire as well, somewhere between a 2.1 and a 2.25. So we'll see once I put wheels to the ground this week and kind of decide. And then I'm also leaning towards a smaller chain ring because I think fatigue and those steep climbs will definitely get you out there. I'm considering the skin suit. I think that that might be a factor. Normally for these long races, I like the jersey um, just for the comfort. 
but I will see that is something that I packed that I wouldn't normally pack for a race quite this long. So that is a unique thing I'm considering as well. You know, I, I've ridden the road pedals in the past, uh, and honestly, I've ridden my mountain bike so much this year that the road, the road shoes and pedals feel weird on the mountain bike now. So I guess I'm officially converted uh, over the light side. But uh, yeah, I think really the main thing is that, you know, I'm running some pretty relatively small tires. Uh, they're like 2.25, uh, pretty thin sidewalls for mountain bike racing. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I did some dropper post. You know, it was pretty sad to see that go. Um, it was pretty fun, pretty rowdy, but I uh, don't think we'll need it out there for the build. But other than that, nothing too crazy. Might put a little bit of a uh, bar tape in the middle of the handlebars so we can hang out in that arrow position on the left road section. But yeah, nothing too fancy. Um, running the build suspension. Because, uh, you know, I'm not getting any younger from my back with the hurt for six and a half hours. Honestly, it's it's not forecast to be super hot, but I find that, like, it's still relatively slow mountain biking. Uh, and my real Achilles heel is the heat. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to be running the full, full vents in the helmet. Um, probably running, like, a lightweight, like, climbing jersey versus, like, an aero jersey. Uh, again, just to stick it with because, uh, yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have just that off for, for this guy. Yeah. I repeat real quick. So, staying cool and uh, staying hydrated and being a top player. Yes. <laughs> I don't really want to let the cat out of the bag, but um, I am not doing a carbon bicycle for Leadville. I know. Whoa. <laughs> Everyone's freaking out about it. Um, no, I'm super excited. It's a really special project and it is just as competitive as my carbon bikes have ever been. And I'm just really stoked on it. I don't know. Again, going back to that like mental space. Um, I'm just, I'm honestly going out there to enjoy myself because I, I had a hard time doing that the last time I raced it. So I actually have been rocking a short sleeve skin suit this season, um, and it's pretty comfy. I never thought I would be a skin suit person, um, but really it's honestly just for ease of peeing, because last, last time at Leadville, Rose and I kind of swapped spots a couple times because we were each peeing. So this is really honestly just a peeing strategy move here. Um, it's easier for me to just peel it off one layer um, and then put it back on. Um, I haven't, I am really honestly trying to race without a pack um, as much as possible because I just don't love it. Um, so no pack, uh, I will not have aero bars on. I don't think that's like a thing. I hope you enjoyed that special episode of the podcast. If you want to follow these athletes all throughout their day, you can find their social handles down below in the description, but you can also follow LT Race Series on Instagram. They'll be posting highlights all throughout the day and you'll be able to follow them, I think on Twitter as well and get all the information that you need. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are racing this event. So if you're racing this event and you're hearing these answers from different athletes, hopefully it doesn't throw you for a loop and make you second guess your approach. I, I bet you've put some thought into that and don't, don't stress, just stick to what you know is best and don't change anything big on race day. It's such a big race day like Leadville for sure. And good luck. Have fun at that race. It's uh. It's such an achievement to even accomplish that one. So good luck to all of you who are doing the race, and let's cheer on all the athletes that are doing the race for all of the rest of us. Thanks a bunch, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon.